and uh, that's certainly something we're going to talk about today as well. And um, as, as a result of that, uh, become a, a source of inspiration for a lot of people, particularly young people out there. And finally, just because we didn't think we had enough outspoken people, um, we, we, we've got one of the most outspoken people that I know of, um, a woman who has proudly um, waded her way through the hot water that that mouth has gotten her into at times, um, but we've done it with style and uh, coolness, and she's proudly unedited and unfiltered, and uh, it was that mouth along with that makeup and that amazing style that helped her win uh, two years ago become the champion of RuPaul's Drag Race. And uh, she is never shy and always has something to say. So, on that note, please welcome everybody, the one and only Big Frida, Laura Jane Grace, and Sharon Needles. Everybody? Out, yes. <laughs> we've we've packed the room. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, most of my, most of my fans are ghosts anyway. I see them all. <laughs> you know, it's not the num. It's not always the numbers. It's 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 who's there. It's not how many are there. It's I would agree there. with that. My manager would, uh, would disagree. <laughs> disagree with that. How's South by going so far for everybody? Good, Frida. It's going awesome for me. Having a wonderful time. Yeah. Lots of energy. Lots of fans, new fans coming from everywhere. I'm having a blast. And, and doing a lot, you're doing like, I think you said three shows today, right? Three today and three more tomorrow. It's been very busy for me. <laughs> Is that, are, are you just completely worn out by the end of the day or do you have energy to spare? I have a little energy to spare. I always keep a little bit for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Laura, I, I, as I told you earlier, I wasn't at you guys showcase at Red 7 the other night, but I heard it was just, just amazing. It was a fun time for sure. Yeah. yeah? And you guys, are, this is, you were telling me, like, your fifth fifth time at South By? Something, something like, that? like that. It's a little blurry, but yeah. I've, you know, bands who, artists who've come here for many years have have seen the evolution for better or worse of this festival and how exponentially it's blown up. And, and you know, and other things that some people are maybe more independent-minded people are not so fond of that's happened at South By. What are your thoughts on the way it's sort of changed in, in that time, the festival? Um, yeah, it just seems like it's only gotten bigger. But I don't know. Other than that. How was the reception the other night? Or, 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 does it seem to you like everyone knows the new record, which I didn't even mention? Transgender Destroyer Blues, sixth album. Right? Truly amazing album. If you guys don't know it, please, please check it out. It's 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 moving and it rocks and it's just. Uh, I want to. We will talk a little bit about the idea behind it later, but people seem to to know it now at this point. You can hear the you can hear the lyrics. Yeah, <laughs> well, that that helps, right? Um, and Miss Needles, what How are you? <laughs> I'm hung over, but I'm great. Yeah, I know you're doing some of your own gigs here, and but also tonight it's very cool. Lou Reed. Yeah, I'm doing the uh, Lou Reed tribute um, uh, show tonight, and and as and as much as like Lou Reed had um, an in, you know an impact on the music I listened to when I was younger. Um, I'm doing it more for Candy Darling. I, I'm doing um, Candy Says, and I mean, she was a huge impact on me with her work with Andy Warhol, Tennessee Williams, and um, yeah, she was she was she was like the first Amanda Lafour. So I, I love her. What so much. of all you know? Because obviously there are plenty of iconic drag figures in history, what or trans figures in history. What what was it about Candy in particular that? I don't know, spoke to you. She lived. She lived in a in a, in a permanent fantasy world, and um, you know, she she was living in the '70s, but emulating um, the blonde bombshells of the '50s, and she, she never dropped character. But she but she drove herself crazy. She was very aware of what she was and what she wasn't, and, and strived so much uh, mentally, physically, and chemically to become what she wanted, and it ended up being her demise. So. Um, you know, as much as her facade is very artificial and the way she acted was very um, um, actressy, there was, there was such a real tortured soul in there. And I liked that about her. And she, was, really and, cool. she, and she was just beautiful, too. And I love to look at beautiful people. And she was just so pretty, gorgeous. Um, what, uh, how did you get involved in the, in the Lou Reed thing? And, 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 uh, I don't know. Yeah? No? 
I don't know how I end up in any, I don't even know why I'm here. <laughs> I don't know how I got here, but I'm very thankful for it. <laughs> and I, it's a real it's a real mixed bag of artists, too, from yourself to, I think, Suzanne Vega's doing yeah. it, right? Uh -huh. The Black Lips are doing it. Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool. I, it's really sort of... It's a pretty broad spectrum. Well, and it's it's humbling too. You know, I act like a I act like a badass, but I also, uh, you know, I didn't have to work as hard as a lot of other artists. I, I auditioned for a TV show hosted by, of course, you know, Miss Miss RuPaul, and uh, and uh, I was just kind of I was just kind of handed uh, opportunities uh, overnight. So it's really humbling to to work with people who've worked for decades um, on their craft, and uh, kind of puts me in my place when I know that I I kind of had somewhat of a cakewalk. Do you, um, what, were you a Big Velvet fan and what, what was your, when you heard about Lou, Lou passing, were you, uh, was it a... Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I was in shock and yeah. he was old, but, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People die, I did it already, <laughs> keep working. Um, uh, but no, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he was talking about topics that no, I mean, I sometimes I wondered if like, you know, teenage rock and roll fans in the Midwest even knew what the fuck he was talking about because he was touching on some pretty, you know, deep topics and talking about certain kinds of people that you only saw in movies if they were serial killers. You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, gender identity is not just showed up in in his famous work, but you know, like Candy says and do 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 do. do. And I mean, these were major rock songs talking about people no one talked about, unless, unless you know, unless it was in Psycho, where, of course, uh, you know, you know, the person with gender identity was a killer, or dressed to kill, or the person with gender identity issues was a killer, or Sleepaway Camp, the famous horror movie, where the person with gender identity problems was a killer. In his songs, they weren't killers. They were, they were, they were killer, but they were killer, weren't murdering anybody. Um, you know, talking about uh, a, a guy who, who celebrated Walking on the Wild Side, you guys each in your own way, and, uh, you know, in, I mean, in different ways and in different places, or in different parts of the country, um, did your own thing from a young age. And Frida, we were talking, when I, we spoke yesterday, you know, I, I think people, I, a lot of us have the impression uh, that New Orleans is certainly compared to Northern Florida or Iowa, which originally Iowa, right, then Pittsburgh, right. for you uh, that New Orleans is a fairly open-minded, sort of accepting place. Um, growing up, was it, was it tough, or was it not so much? Well, definitely growing up in New Orleans was not so easy. Um, you know, it's a place that's embraced by the people of New Orleans, but um, growing up was not easy for me or Katie Red or any of the queens that came out around our time. Uh, it, it used to go so far as where we used to have family members uh, basically trying to fight us because we were gay and trying to say, I would per se, well, I'm going to beat it out of them. Or, right. uh, I'm that just, works. It never works. <laughs> of course it not. never works. And it's like... You know, you can fight me, you can try to, you know, pick on me. You know, I was bullied, name calling, all of that through high school, through middle school. But it also made me strong to be able to deal with all of the people that I had to deal with in New Orleans. So uh, we had some trying times when we were growing up. But over the years, it started being more and more accepted. Each year was just, you know, they saw that they couldn't change it. And we weren't giving up. You know, when I started my journey, I said that I will be one of the first queens in New Orleans to change people's mind about queens and how they feel about um, being able to come up to them, being able to confront them, and just be just be able to shake my hand without being threatened or whatever. And I did that. I definitely transformed a lot of people in New Orleans. Boys will come up to me now, hey, Frida, how you doing? Or, you know, shake my hand without feeling threatened. And that's very important to me because it helped shape New Orleans a little bit and let people be more open-minded. You know, we had people like Bobby Marchand, um, Little Richard, a lot of people that performed in New Orleans way before our time and opened the doors um, for our community. And when me and Katie jumped in the game in 1998 with The Bounce, Katie was the first transsexual male to come out with Bounce music in New Orleans. People were not ready for it. Like, we were getting slack from everywhere. 
we were having things thrown at us at different concerts, but that changed over the years for sure because we were, we, st we stood firm on who we were, we didn't give up, and we had a dream that we were trying to follow. And look where we are now. And is, is part of that just society changing in general, or was it specifically you guys and having the success, the gradual success you had? Gradual success, as well as the females in New Orleans, they help that, shape that as well, because we're embraced by them. They love us so much. And when they're like, kind of like we protect them, they protect us. And that kind of <clears throat> forms a circle around us from the guys. And like what we do in Bounce Music, you know, we bring tons and tons of girls out. And as we're bringing the girls out, they're coming to shake their asses. <laughs> and when they come, the, the fellows will follow. So it, it kind of was like an uh, even exchange. The girls helping us and we're helping them. And it kind of made the whole circle go around. Then the guys just started falling in love with us. Y'all y'all got all the girls shaking. Y'all got them bouncing their asses everywhere. <laughs> hey, Frida, um, right. I'm rolling with you, you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it started changing. And that, that was the help of uh, the community in New Orleans. Your style, and I think part of the reason that the Fuse show has been such a hit, people have taken to it so much in such a huge way, is it's very inclusive. I mean, there is... There's, you know, charisma and a warmth about you that I think is, lends itself to that. I would imagine at this point your shows are a real mix, of straight, gay, male, female. Yes, definitely. Right? The shows are definitely definitely mixed up, and I am very appreciative of that. And But when I first started, I never would perform at gay clubs. Like, I wasn't being called at the gay clubs. I was being you know, run down by all of the straight clubs. And that's where I really started and got my fan bases in all the straight clubs. And then I expanded out to the gay clubs and uh, started working them. But it, it was always the girls that came out to support us and to see us, same as today. It's more women that support our movement in New Orleans with the bounce music mm -hmm. than, the, than men. But then the men started to you know, like I said, whether women or the men may follow. For so sure. then it started flooding with everybody, and that's how it became <laughs> a big mix crowd. Sure, I mean, as, as sort of uh, all welcoming as Frida's style is, I mean, you can be, I guess it's safe to say, somewhat more in your face um, with your, in your shows, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, do you. I'm not here to please them all. Right, right. I mean, is your, do you, is your feeling sort of like. Whoever wants to come to my the party, great, you're welcome, but it is what it is, and I'm not going to change or tone, or tone anything down to sort of appeal to... I, well, I used to say I wouldn't change, and now um, the world is so loud, you know, like everyone's opinion is so heard that, I mean, I can't help but be affected. I'm, I'm not, I, I wish I was Gigi Allen, but I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't have, I don't have that steel set of balls, and... I would say I'm somewhat adept. I mean, that's why my new my album's called PG-13. I was an X-rated act in a PG industry, so so I definitely bent. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I didn't grow I didn't grow up with like Madonna and Celine Dion. I like grew up with like Divine and right. and the Pistols and Dictators, Buzzcocks, and you know, Gigi Allen. You know, you know. People who you people who used really brash um, vocals and imagery to, to get a, a, a statement across, and, and there's been times in my career where you know I'm just like I'm really going to alienate myself in this job, but I, I can't help it. <laughs> I can't help it. Yeah. Um. And Laura, I, I mean, speaking of people that don't you know don't back down or I mean, you know, long before people even had an inkling because they were. There were times in earlier records when you would lyrically semi-address gender dysphoria, right? I mean, but even long before that, I mean, you were you you were a sort of you know take no shit you know kid in Florida, right? I mean, I mean, you were, and that was did. How early on did you think you'd like to incorporate some of the issues that we now see in the in the TGB album? In, in the into your music, I mean, early on, and were you were, were there times when you would say, "No, maybe I shouldn't even go there." Sure, I mean, 
literally every single Against Me record has songs that are me like dealing with gender dysphoria or whatever. Um, and then it, after a point, it almost just kind of became a game of like, how much can you get away with saying, you know? Like on our fourth record, having a lyric, if I could have chosen, I would have been born a woman. My mother once told me she would have named me Laura. I thought for sure someone was going to like ask me something about that. Like I remember singing it in the studio and even stopping and being like, does anyone think that lyric is weird? And everyone was like, no, it's great. Go ahead. Go for it. Yeah. But nothing, never. And so, so there were people around, I mean the rest of the band, or other, other people who would give you their opinion on whether or not you should, how, how much you should go there. Well, there's people I'd ask their opinion, but yeah. no one ever really gave an opinion. No. Right, yeah. right. And then this, and then to what extent is this album, because from what I understand anyway, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a fictional element <laughs> to the record too, right? Well, I said that originally, like to start off with, just because I was maybe a little uncomfortable with how personal the record was. Oh. But I mean, it's an autobiographical record. Pull Some on. of it's like trying to put it onto a hypothetical, hypothetical character or whatever, but it's all lived experience, you know? Um, and then, and you actually wrote, started writing the record. It, that predated your sort of, sort of coming out. I started writing it in 2009, yeah. Yeah. Did it come together relatively quickly, or? Um, I don't know, I feel like every record we make kind of, it's a little harder to, to finish, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It was like a different approach. I was writing to like, you know, save my life. I was just trying to not kill myself, as opposed to like writing a record to make a record, you know? Yeah. And you feel people are connecting? You know, I mean, I don't know what. I, I think people really connect. I think, I mean, like, on the surface, sure, like, having a record that's called, like, Transgender Dysphoria Blues and songs that, like, overtly talk about trans issues, on the surface, sure, it looks like it's really geared towards that. Yeah. But I think, like, the experience of feeling alienated, feeling like you don't fit in, um, dealing with addiction, dealing with depression, dealing with things like that, those are universal issues that aren't just exclusive to any kind of, like, any gender. You know? Yeah. But like the earlier, like uh, Form of Clarity and New Wave, those records, they were still, uh, they were introspective in a way that uh, that some punk bands or a fair number of punk bands maybe aren't. I mean, and do you think that that kind of introspection that was laced throughout some of those records came came from the the dysphoria, or is it just sort of who you are? So, sure. I mean, I think that that's colored my whole existence. Yeah. You know, like. In, perspective that I'm coming from in a lot of ways of, again, feeling like you don't fit in from a very young age and feeling like a misalignment, you know? Um, and then, I, I don't know, for me, like, I think that, you know, what attracted me to punk rock in the first place was, was the politics, but at the same time, I think that you have to find the politics in your personal existence for it, for it to be real, as opposed to just getting commentary on stuff that you've never lived or have no experience to, uh, with. I mean, if Tessori wasn't even a part of who you were, I would think that politics, your interest in politics, your interest in, in, in anarchistic rock, punk rock, it would have would still be there. I mean, that seems to be Sure, but I, I mean, I had like defining moments throughout my life. Like, when I was 14, I got beat up by the cops and arrested, and that was a moment that really politicized me. And I, I grew up in a military family on army bases all over the world, so like, being around like, military complex from a very young age and having those experiences and getting my ass kicked in high school and things like that were all points along the way where you realize that getting your ass kicked from just being a rebel life. just being a punk kid or or yeah i mean if you have long hair and you're in middle school and people call you a faggot and they kick your ass you know i mean that was just yeah. kind of part of it and especially in a place like south florida where i don't know like it was i had a small group of friends that you know that, that are the freaks who sit together at lunch right. and yeah, yeah. Sharon, was it similar for you? I mean, well, I don't know oh, what, yeah. what was the town in what was the town in Iowa? That New Nile, I'm a Maytag dishwasher's and dry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, and I, I mean, uh, like I was old enough to know that I wanted to like be different and look different, but I was innocent enough just not to realize why it was gaining so much attention. And I'll never, I'll never forget the day. It was February 9th, 1996. Was the day I shaved my eyebrows off. And like, I went from like looking like a normal, you know, fourteen-year-old boy to, you know, overnight just having you know, 
pink hair and wearing fetish clothes and wearing full faces of makeup, going, you know, going to school in drag, just thinking I was just going to blend right on in that little school. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I didn't. But it's nice to hear you at least had a small group of friends. I would have, lo I would have loved some of those. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, putting studs on it, a leather jacket. It really did. And my dad was a psychologist and he'd always say, I think you're using this as a, you know, as a psychological mask to hide uh, what you're doing. I'm like, no, I just am really interested in fashion. No, my dad was probably pretty um, right on that, but uh, I, I still rely on that costume. I, I still love her. I love putting her on, and I love becoming her, and I love who she is. And uh, But, yeah, high school sucked, yeah. I, I, only, I only went my first year. I, I left after my first year. Mm -hmm. So that's why when people say, where did you go to college, I always say, F you. <laughs> and then you moved to Pittsburgh from there? No, um, when I, I left when I was I left Iowa when I was like 18 and um, just kind of bobbled around to like you know punk communes and stuff like in Denver and Tucson, New Mexico, Chicago, and then uh, I was actually like trying to get out of like um, an eight month. Uh, I didn't want to go to jail, so I left. I left Boulder, uh, Iowa, and kind of ran from the charge, and I went to Pittsburgh. I thought I'd just be there a couple weeks, but I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. It's like Seattle, except we don't advertise. <laughs> <laughs> Was that ever resolved, or is there still a warrant out for Aaron somewhere? I don't know. I don't know <laughs> Stay out of Boulder when I can. <laughs> um, and for you, for you, is school a, a tough place or a welcoming place? Well, it definitely was not welcoming as, as well. I was going through my transformation of, you know, trying to find my sense of style. So I would always have these different hairstyles and my mom would get called by the principal and by the school counselor. Uh, Freddie's hair is causing too much attention. We need to take him out of school or they'll suspend me for three days. And my mom was like, well, he can wear his hair how he chooses to wear his hair. Everybody else wearing their hair how they choose. So my mom would come to the school, fight with the principal. She would come in there and curse everybody out. And <laughs> I would go to school with my hair, you know, like Mark Simpson, <laughs> you know, really high. And I would put some color in it. So I was, I was trying to find myself as well. And um, after, you know, they figured they couldn't do nothing about it. You know, we wasn't even happening. My mom would say, well, if he can't be in school, we're going to go to the school board. It was going that far. So they wind up letting me wear my hair and do my thing or whatever. And we, you know, I did have some issues with the kids at school, you know, picking on us, would call me fat faggot. And, you know, it, it, was, it was tough, but I got through it. I definitely got through it. Um, it made me stronger. It made me get back out there and definitely want to fight. Mom would say, somebody pick on you, somebody hit you, you hit them back and you go back and I would go back to school and I wouldn't stop. Are you surprised, if you said to yourself 10 years ago, someone said to you that you could be the star of your own reality TV show, I mean, it's, it's not nothing that we've reached a point where someone who presents in the way you do, and don't get me wrong, the, sh the music, the shows are so engaging that there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be as at the popularity you you currently have. But I, I mean, it, it's not that long ago that I, I think most producers would be like, it's just she presents herself in a way that's just a bit. I don't know if we can sign on to that. And does it did it surprise you when when they went for it? Um. It did, but it was a slow process. It was, you know, creeping up at, at, at a slow pace. And, um, you know, like I say, each year it would change and it would get bigger and better. So as time elevated, I just kept myself humble before it got to what the point that we are at now. So, you know, over the years when different producers, and it's kind of like, when one producer see another producer is interested in it, they kind of want to jump on the bandwagon. So that's kind of where, you know, you get your ride from. When you have somebody who's strong enough, you know, male, per se, a male uh, producer, who's strong enough and wants to work with you and engage and do something of, on your project, then you have other producers reaching out and, and wanting to work with you and other people and they open doors and, you know, if it's just one big name who's, willing to work with you, or one popular person, it opens up a lot of doors. 
Have they put as your producers World of Wonder or or Fuse put any restrictions on the kind of content there can be in the show? Is that one reason I ask that is because I remember there was a moment in the Brazil when you guys arrived in Brazil, which I thought was really key. You like look out the window and there's a like uh, I guess it's a military academy or training school, and there's and there's soldiers walking around. All the marching men. <laughs> yeah, all these marching men, and she's like, "Oh, I like I like that. Don't ask, don't tell, or something like that." And I, and I was like, I was like, you know, that's such a nice moment, but there aren't many moments in the show where you are allowed to be sexual or get into your relationship slash personal life. Is that true? Would you agree with that? And I don't know if it's allowed to, but you don't really. Um, I didn't really in season one. Oh. But season two, you'll see my boyfriend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's coming on board. Me and him actually was having some issues in season one um, where he was having a little identity problems. So that's why he didn't make it into the show. He actually was in the show. We had got tons of footage. And me and him was having some issues at home, and he was kept like going back and forth, pulling me out the show. You know, I'm gonna be there this day, and it just was driving me so much. I was like, pull his ass out of every episode. I don't want him in it. <laughs> we'll try this next year or whatever if we pick up a season two. So now he's down for season two. So you'll get to see my personal life a little bit more in depth. And um, nice. not too much sexual, though. Well, not, not <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 definitely. Cool. Sharon, um, you, your, um, your, I guess now, ex-relationship um, was captured, was, was documented for a while there, right? Was that anything you and Alaska had a problem with doing, or? Um, no. You guys are um, pretty open about, you know. No, we both wanted to be on TV, that's what it was. Oh, so so uh, we, we knew that the topic of our relationship <laughs> was going to be documented. We even, uh, World of Wonder even produced, we did.